<laughs> okay, uh, uh, welcome everyone. Um, on behalf of the Kootenai Library Federation, we welcome you to our conversation here tonight with Jennifer Nielsen. Um, we also want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded territory of the Sinaixt and the Tanaha. And this place is also home to the Métis for many years and many other diverse Indigenous peoples. Um, so Jennifer, we're so honored to have you back. Last year you came and um, talked to us about A Night Divided. And this year it was uh, The False Prince that we read um, this month. Um, so welcome. Um, I think we'll skip introductions, but Jennifer, do you want to just introduce yourself to the um, to the whole Kootenays? <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm Jennifer Nielsen. I live in the mountains of northern Utah uh, with my family. Um, I enjoy old books and time in the mountains and uh, watching old movies. And I don't know if chocolate can be a, a hobby, but if it is, I have mastered it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, I'm going to read the first question um, because it is from um, a teen here in um, my hometown here, El and his name is Elling, and he couldn't make it to the meeting tonight. He was bummed about it, but he wanted me to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. He is a creative writer, and he says that he often gets, um, gets kind of bogged down with the details. He has really mm -hmm. good inspiration, um, but then he, when he gets, sits down to write, he gets stuck. So he wants to ask how you deal with writer's block and do you find it better to force yourself to sit for little chunks of time every day or do you only write when you feel inspired? And he says, I think I sometimes get stuck in very detailed specific writing and have a harder time writing general notes about how the story is unfolding. And do you think this is contributing to writer's block? Hmm. All right, um, it's Eileen. Eileen. Eileen, all right. Um, you've got a few questions here. They are all of them super important. So I'm going to take them one at a time. Let's start with the first of, uh, do I, you know, find that I, I do better by forcing myself to sit down and write, um, in bigger chunks, or do I wait for the inspiration? And the thing is, if we just waited, you know, for like the views to strike, you know, and it's just like, oh, I'm feeling it, I'm feeling it. Well, like that's not going to work, right? We have deadlines. All right. And sometimes, you know, we write even when we're not inspired, even when it's not just golden sunshine all around us. And that's OK. All right. Um, if you are having trouble finding that inspiration, go back to your creative place. Whatever it is you do that makes you want to write, go back and do that thing whenever you are like really needing to motivate yourself. But a lot of it is just sitting in the chair and opening that document and typing. It is better to type bad words than to type no words because I can edit what isn't good, but I can't edit a, a blank page. So I write no matter what. Now let's talk about the details. All right, this is um, an amazing thing that you are able to write with so much detail. Don't be down on yourself about that. That is a sign of talent. All right, but I know it's bogging you down from uh, writing the whole story. So I'm gonna give you a couple of uh, things to consider. Number one, when you look at the details to include or not to include, you don't need to tell me about the things I already know about. For example, if you're describing a tree, I know what a tree looks like, I've seen that. And so you don't need to give me everything about the tree. What you do is you tell me what makes it different different than, than what I've seen before. So now you're only pulling out the one or two details that defines it differently. You think about the way that JK Rowling described Voldemort. She doesn't give a head to toe description of him. Instead, she looks for tiny little details. For example, unnaturally long fingers, that single detail, and she'll repeat that over and over, that single detail does more to add to his creep factor than if she had given us a head to toe description. So you give details on what makes it different. Now, is that causing your writer's block? Yes and no, all right, it is bogging you down. But again, 
you just write your details. That's fine. Don't, don't worry about it. You can edit that later and get it just to the level you want. Just keep putting words on paper, but let's talk specifically about writer's block because once you understand it, it's actually really easy to solve. So I'm going to pull out some paper here. Um, every plot, um, every plot, if we break it down, it's just a problem the main character needs to solve, right? So if we, if we draw a picture of it, it looks like this, right? Here's the beginning. And that's where your character first understands they've got a problem. The character is going to try to solve it. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's going to end up at the climax where they have to solve it. And then there's just a little falling off. Every plot looks like this. Where we get stuck is right here. That's right in the middle. And we call it the muddy middle because every word, it's like trolling through mud. And your character looks at you saying, what do you want to do? And you look at your character saying, I don't know. What do you want to do? And you just stare at each other. All right. Now, the reason that we have this writer's block, it is because your character does not have enough problems. All right. They have this problem, but you can't solve this problem till the end of the book. Right here, they need a problem. So, Aline, this is our rule. Okay. We are nice people. All right. We've got to be nice people, but nobody wants a book from a nice author. All right. So, we are nice people and we are cruel authors. As soon as you get stuck right here, I want you to ask yourself this question What is the meanest, most horrible thing I can do to my character right now? <laughs> All right. Do they need to get lost or betrayed or you kill somebody they love or their house blows up? All right. I don't know. But you do something horrible to your character right here that's going to push you out of the writer's block and continue, let you continue on with the story. With this, you should not ever have to worry about writer's block again. Awesome. Great questions. Awesome. We've got another question. Mm -hmm. um, this one's from me, actually. So I'm just wondering, on that vein of your process of writing, what your process is like for your world building for a fantasy series like this? So the politics the geography, the culture, like throughout the whole series, does it just come to you in your head or do you map it out? Yeah, there's always a map. There's always a map because the map defines the world. And I mean, I would create a map even if I was writing about, you know, my high school, I, because the way that I do that map is still going to uh, create the parameters for the story. And so I start with the map because I have to make active decisions there that will have real impacts on the story. Is there a lot of water or is this desert or mountains? Um, any one of those decisions is going to affect the plot. And, uh, and I start to decide what about the countries around it? Do they have a port? What's the distance between cities? And uh, so a lot of the decisions are just going to be made in that map making process. And then I uh, realize that every decision I make is going to have consequences for world building. For, for example, um, if there's a lot of desert, I know that my characters are going to have to spend a significant amount of time in the story obtaining water and water becomes valuable. And so now I know it's, you know, if, if there's an opportunity to, like that water is going to be where the population centers are. If you go without water, that represents death for a character. And, and so the big decisions start to force smaller decisions and smaller decisions. If I have a cold weather climate, I know food doesn't grow year round, which means there's probably some people in this country who are hungry, which means now we have a class system. Um, and that means now we have probably some uh, power um, structures involved. So see every decision, I then look at the consequences and the consequences and that builds the world. It's so interesting, thank you. Oh, that's a great question, Laura. Um, okay, so um, you partially answered my question, um, what comes first, the characters or the plot? Um, and it, it, it feels to me like maybe some of it's happen happening simultaneously. Yeah, because, so 
so it's character, but it's not character in a vacuum, you know? So everything starts like in the false prince, it starts with sage, right? Um, but sage on his own, any main character or hero or protagonist, they're just going to be walking along living their life until they come into conflict with the antagonist or the villain, right? And so um, as soon as I have that clash, I've got to know enough about my world to know what that clash is going to be. So there has to be some world building. Mm -hmm. um, but once I have that clash, now I can start to build the world around these two. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be um, a few characters who are on Sage's side to help him. But most of the characters are going to be there to get in his way. And so everything gets built around the protagonist and the antagonist, making sure that at all times there is more against him than there is for him. And um, but it has there has to be some simultaneous um, world building as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a great question. I love that one. <laughs> Angela, did you have a question? Uh, sure. Yes, I did. I I saw that you sent a little in the chat, but I couldn't see the whole thing. I'm having troubles with my uh, phone. Um, I so you mentioned in our chat with the children, the youth, um, that the J.K. Rowling, the Goblet of Fire, was your sort of favorite fantasy. I just wondered if you had other um, fantasy novels that influenced your writing in any way and if do you read a lot of that kind of thing you know um the fascinating thing with uh, harry potter specifically is of course it is a fantasy right but that's not mm -hmm. why they became this worldwide phenomenon right mm -hmm. ultimately harry potter is a mystery novel I mean, it's no wonder that, that J.K. Rowling is writing mystery novels. That's a lot of who she is. She's a mystery novelist mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. happened to create this amazing fantasy series. And the fact that she was fluent in uh, these two genres is what created this phenomenon. And so absolutely, I do read fantasy novels, but never exclusively. Um, I read from every shelf of the library and new authors because it rounds out who mm -hmm. I am. As, as a writer. And so, um, you know, I read the classics because they are so much better than I thought they were when I was a kid. And, uh, and I read a lot of nonfiction. I read contemporary novelists like uh, Linda Mullaly Hunt is a personal favorite of mine. Um, historical authors like Alan Gratz. And um, I love uh, <laughs> the author that's just slipping my mind, Lee Bardugo. I think is brilliant in uh, in uh, fantasy uh, writing. Marissa Meyer for kind of that that sci-fi sort of an edge, and and the fact that I read across genres helps me write in any single genre um, as a rule. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for sharing um, all these secrets of your craft. <laughs> and we just, we love this book so much. Um, we loved reading it. Um, thank you for being with us tonight. And we wish you all the best with your uh, future screenplay, if that happens. <laughs> Very exciting. <laughs> mm -hmm. totally. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for choosing this as a book. Thank you for making it available to your young readers and, and to any young readers who are watching. Um, just read, yeah. read, find a book that you've never tried before. Keep reading. There's nothing more important you can do for your life than to be a reader. Yeah. And we just love that, you know, um, that we read this first book of the Ascendant series. Uh, and it's such a delight to know that there are four more books after that. And so um, kids, we've got them here <laughs> at the library and uh and we'll keep enjoying uh, your work, I'm sure, for, for a long time to come. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Bye.